And I'm just going to say, I'm just having a look now just to welcome all our participants. Thanks for joining us. It's two minutes past the hour and um, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you, Trudy, thank you, Shauna, and Judy, and Lauren, and all the team, and I'm delighted um, to be invited once again to give a talk on, uh, this time, on Shabbat Aisvi. I'll just try and share my screen here. Hang on one second. Just one second. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> right. So Shabbat V. Now this talk does come with a bit of a health warning. Uh, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, you will be amazed, you will be amused, you will be shocked, you will be appalled. The 17th century Sabbatean movement was the most important messianic movement in Judaism. It's difficult to get an objective account about the false messiah Shabbatai Svi because opinion was so divided about him. His opponents spread lies about him, while his followers might have had only good things to say. The pity is that we don't have full documentation of what happened, as most reports were deliberately destroyed or accidentally went up in flames. And the only portrait we have is of this one, uh, which was done by a Christian in 1665, in Smyrna. So there have been many messiahs in Jewish history. Uh, Jesus, Trudy's mentioned the 16th century David Rubeni, and there were others like uh, Bar Kochma, for instance, in the second century. And the most authoritative source on Shabbatai Sfi is, is this book here, by the expert on Jewish mysticism, Gershom Sholem. It took him 20 years to write. And Sholem must have studied every single source about Svi, and he brings it all together in this massive book. In fact, Svi took the Jewish world by storm over the space of only one year, between 1665 and 1666. A messianic fever swept the Jewish world from Smyrna to Leghorn, uh, known as Livorno today, to Venice, Amsterdam, Hamburg, Poland and Morocco, even Persia and Yemen. Jews abandoned their families, sold their assets, packed their bags and traveled to Palestine to greet the Messiah. He had amongst his followers not just ordinary people, but important rabbis. The trigger for the messianic outbreak was the 1648 Polish massacres, the Szelniki or Szelniski riots. As many as 300,000 Jews could have died. According to Jewish eschatology, the Messiah will emerge at the end of days after a terrible calamity gather the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth to Israel and save them. But the movement did not originate in Poland, and it was not just a response to despair. It enjoyed popularity in peaceful and prosperous centers of the Jewish world too. His supporters were devastated in September 1668, when Svi was given the choice by the Ottoman Sultan between conversion or death. He chose conversion. So who was Svi? His family was Romaniot from Greece. They lived in Patras, which is the red triangle you see to the left of Athens. Uh, Patras was the largest Jewish community in the Peloponnese. 
Romaniot was the name given to the original Jewish community who settled in Greece, Turkey and the Balkans at the time of the Roman Empire before they were joined by Sephardim fleeing the Spanish Inquisition. Gershon Sholem thinks that Svi is not, an Ash uh, not a Sephardi name and he may have had Ashkenazi roots, but this is not proven. Shabbatai's father Mordechai Svi moved to Smyrna, present day Izmir from Patras. And you can see Izmir there on the Turkish coast. In fact, this map shows you all the places where uh, Svi either lived or visited during his life, ending with, with a, Mont a, a, a village in Montenegro um, where he died. So uh, Izmir is the modern day name for Smyrna where um, Shabbatai grew up. And Shabbatai's father, Mordechai Svi, moved to Smyrna from Patras. Smyrna was a thriving trading port in the 17th century. Mordechai was a poulterer, an egg dealer, and commercial agent for a British trading house. He was very successful and became wealthy. He had three sons. Shabbatai was the middle one. Elijah the eldest and Joseph the youngest. His brothers stood by him throughout and bankrolled him. We don't know to which congregation Mordechai belonged and Shabbatai's parents had died by the time the Sabbatean movement took off. Shabbatai was born on Tisha B'Av, a significant date, probably in 1626. He received a traditional Jewish education. He showed signs of talent for rabbinical studies. He studied under Rabbi Joseph Iskofa, one of the most illustrious of Smyrna rabbis, who was later to excommunicate him. Shabbatai was ordained as Chacham, the name for a rabbi in the Sephardi world. He studied Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, after he was ordained in, in the Ashkenazi tradition, you have to be over 40 to study Kabbalah, but there was never an age limit in the Sephardi tradition. Aged 18, Shabbatai became an ascetic or Hasid. Like the early Kabbalists in Sfat or Safed, he would fast all day and go into the fields outside the city. He had a dream. A flame descended on him and burnt his penis. We don't know if this affected his marriages. He was three times married and supposedly didn't consummate the marriages. Uh, did he or did he not consummate the third marriage? We don't really know. Apparently, he was tortured by sexual dreams from an early age. He married his first wife, age 22, and divorced her a few months later. The same happened with his second wife. We shall come back to his third wife, Sarah. So to understand the intellectual underpinning of the Sabbatean movement, you have to understand Jewish mysticism. Kabbalah was systematized by Isaac Luria in Safed in the 16th century. You cannot grasp God's essence except through a network of symbolic representations. You can, however, approach God through his emanations or sefirot, which you see here on uh, the chart. Um, each sefira co corresponds to a name of God and represents a divine attribute like justice or mercy. Every act and every good deed or prayer brings up the divine presence to a higher spiritual realm. This is called the process of tikkun, bringing up divine sparks to a higher level. Essential to tikkun is reformation of the soul and individual repentance. When that is complete, the messianic age will begin. 
the Messiah would reveal God's name by reconnecting the four letters of his name. Fusing all the divine sparks together, God's light would be manifest to all at the time of redemption and stream downwards. This would herald the end of oppression and exile. So what kind of personality did Shabbatai have? He alternated between periods of exaltation and elation and periods of depression. Those of you who are psychologists or psychiatrists will recognize the characteristics of a bipolar personality or what we would call a manic depressive. In one period of elation, he even claimed he could fly, quoting the verse from Isaiah, I will ascend above the, the heights of the clouds, but nobody actually saw him do it. In moments of depression, he would say, God's face was hid from him. He would lock himself in a room or retreat to the mountains or caves. He did not sleep regularly, those who witnessed his periods of exaltation reported that his cheeks were red and his face glowed like a shining mirror, like Moses, like the face of the sun. Even his opponents said that his face shined so brightly, it was impossible to look into his face. In moments of exaltation, he performed strange acts, flouting the commandments of the Torah. His followers did not use terms such as illness, but theological explanations. It all began in 1648, that momentous year of the Khmelnytsky massacres by the Cossacks, when Shabbatai was walking along meditating, and he heard the voice of God speaking to him. Thou art the savior of Israel, Messiah, son of David, the anointed of the God of Jacob, thou art destined to redeem Israel, to gather it from the four corners of the earth to Jerusalem. It was then he pronounced the ineffable name. Only the high priest, the Kohen Hagadol, is allowed to say God's name when he goes into the inner sanctum of the temple in Jerusalem, and only once a year on Yom Kippur. Shabbatai considered that he had risen up the mystical ladder and was connecting the two halves of God's name together. He uttered it frequently. The patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had told him that he was destined to be the Messiah. 1648 is mentioned by the Kabbalah as the year of resurrection and the date of redemption. Some people say that Shabbatai was influenced by English millenarianism, which would have reached him through his father's business contacts. But Gershom Sholem says he doubts whether Shabbatai came into contact with, with any British millenarians. Back in Smyrna, Shabbatai's first public appearance declaring himself the Messiah caused a scandal. Nobody took him seriously. He was considered either ill, a fool, or a madman. He had covered himself in oils and emitted a strange smell. He claimed to be anointed by the patriarchs. The reaction was overwhelmingly negative. It was thought unseeming for a rabbi to use perfume. But he loved to sing and had a captivating voice. His followers attested to his charisma and quiet nobility. Soon after 1648, the story goes that he almost drowned in a whirlpool and was saved. This event came to be celebrated on the 16th of Kislev by his followers as the Sabbatean Purim. Another story has him trying to make the sun stand still at noon. This was too much for the religious establishment and he was summoned by his mentor, Rabbi Escofa, whose grave you see here. Shabbatai refused to appear. 
Escoffa threatened to excommunicate him. There began three years of persecution, resulting in him being banished from Smyrna. He wandered around the Ottoman Empire. He first spent time in Salonika, known as Little Jerusalem, since it had such a large Jewish community. In Salonika, he erected a chuppah, a marriage canopy, and performed a marriage ceremony between himself and the Torah. This episode shocked the rabbis and caused another scandal. He then spent eight months in Constantinople. On one occasion, he bought a large fish, dressed it as a baby, and put it into a cradle. He explained it in terms of astrological redemption. The fish symbolized the sign of Pisces. In another episode, he celebrated the three pilgrim festivals in one week to atone for Israel's sins. He was summoned by the Beth Din. He was flogged and excommunicated. It became his hallmark perversely to perform provocative acts, the opposite of the mitzvot. Sin became holy. In the messianic age, everything forbidden becomes permitted. He returned to Smyrna after an exile of five years. When the great fire of 1660 broke out in the city, he said this was the finger of God calling his people to repentance. In Cairo, he met the head of the community, Raphael Joseph, a wealthy man who was master of the mint and banking. Known as generous and ascetic, Joseph was to become a supporter of Shabbatai. From Cairo, Shabbatai went to Jerusalem in 1662. The city was home to about 300 families. There he led the life of a pious ascetic wandering around the Judean desert. He gathered a circle of like-minded ascetics around him. At this time, the Turks levied extortionist taxes on the Jewish community in Jerusalem. In 1663, Shabbatai was sent down to Egypt to raise funds. He went there via Hebron. While in Hebron, he was clearly having one of his highs. He chanted psalms all night long, fasted. His face was blazing. Onlookers said it was like looking into fire. The fasting did not seem to affect him. He was of large build and strong and had a round beard. He arrived in Cairo and stayed for two years. In 1664, he married his third wife, Sarah. She announced herself as the bride of the Messiah. Sarah had a strange background. She and her brother were both orphaned in the Shelniki massacres of 1648. She claimed to have been forcibly converted to Catholicism and brought up in a Polish convent. After that, they fled to Amsterdam and then to Italy. There she gained a reputation for licentiousness. In other words, she was a prostitute, but others maintain that she was a virgin. Shabbatai married Sarah, to fulfill the verse in Hosea, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. Raphael Joseph organized a grand wedding and donated his fortune to Shabbatai. During 1664, Shabbatai seems to have returned to a relatively normal life. He managed to collect a considerable sum for Jerusalem's poor. It was back in Jerusalem in 1665 that he met a man who was to have a huge influence on the Messianic movement, Abraham Nathan, who would become known as Nathan of Gaza. And this is his portrait here. Nathan's father had moved to Jerusalem from Poland or Germany. His name was Elisha Haim ben Jacob Ashkenazi. 
Jews who came from Europe bore the name Ashkenazi sometimes because they stood out as the exception in a majority Sephardi community. And the majority of Jerusalem's Jews were then Sephardi. Nathan's father was a scholar and Kabbalist. He wandered around the Jewish world. From Poland and Germany, he went to Italy. In Venice, he published Kabbalistic works. He died in Meknes in Morocco in 1673. Nathan himself was born in 1643. He was 20 years younger than Shabbatai, but proved to be his leading disciple. Nathan was a brilliant scholar. He studied under a rabbi called Jacob Hagiz, whose son ironically became a fierce opponent of Shabbatai. Nathan was married off to the daughter of Samuel Lissabona, a wealthy merchant with family in Gaza. Nathan moved to Gaza to continue his studies of Kabbalah. When they met, Shabbatai was having an ecstatic experience. This was in February or March, 1665. It struck Nathan like a thunderbolt. He recognized Shabbatai as the true Messiah by the signs which the Kabbalist Isaac Luria had taught. God spoke to him and gave him a vision of the Redeemer. He had been told to expect a great light, sometimes a human face. He saw Shabbatai's face on the divine chariot. He said, thus saith the Lord, behold your savior cometh, Shabbatai Svi is his name. What was significant about Nathan of Gaza's encounter with Shabbatai is that someone other than Shabbatai himself had validated his claim to be the Messiah. Nathan was John the Baptist and St. Paul rolled into one. Gershom Sholem is as admiring of Nathan as he is disparaging of Shabbatai. Nathan was everything that Shabbatai was not. Nathan was a great theologian, an original thinker, without the ups and downs of manic depression. He had considerable literal ability, whereas Shabbatai had not written a single book. Says Sholem, Shabbatai was a poor leader, passive and prone to, to strange acts. The two men complemented each other. Without that combination, the Sabbatean movement would not have developed. From visionary prophet, Nathan moved on to become um, spiritual director, here's another picture of him, or doctor of souls for those who sought tikkun, that is to say reformation of their souls, which was a sort of prerequisite uh, for the messianic age. Nathan imposed penances on the Jews of Gaza. The two spent hours talking. They traveled together. In May, 1665, Shabbatai revealed himself as the Messiah. On Shavuot, 1665, which is when Jews stay up all night to study, Nathan fell into a trance and did an ecstatic dance stripping himself of his clothing and then falling into a swoon. Shabbatai became known as Amira, a Hebrew acronym for our Lord and King, his majesty be exalted. He was addicted to gematria, which is adding up the numerical value of letters. His name Shabbatai spelt God's name, he said. He wore three rings and signed with a crooked serpent on the end of his name. The word serpent had the same numerical value as Mashiach. And of course, he fitted the job description being born on Tisha B'Av. The Messianic age would be revolutionary. It would usher in a time when all laws would be abjured and everything that was hitherto forbidden would be permitted. He abolished the fast of the 17th of Tammuz and replaced it with feasting and rejoicing in Gaza. He wrote to other communities forbidding all fasts. 
Most Jews in Gaza and Hebron joined the believers. He broke the laws of Kashrut by feeding the fat of the kidney, Heleb, to 10 Israelites, reciting, blessed art thou, O God, king of the universe, who permittest that which is forbidden. Nathan continue, continued to preach prayer and penitence. Here he is again, leading the tribes of Israel to the Holy Land. In Jerusalem, many rabbis opposed Shabbatai. They knew him well. They had had him flogged for blasphemy and they were shocked at Nathan's endorsement. They mocked him. He went away to Egypt as a shaliach and returned a mashiach. Some even accused him of keeping some of the money he had raised in Egypt. The rabbis denounced him to the local Turkish Qadi or judge, but the Qadi refused to intervene in the dispute. Shabbatai was acquitted. He even obtained permission to ride on horseback seven times through the city in violation of the Dimmi rules, which decreed that Jews could only ride mules, not horses. He wore a green mantle the color of paradise in Islam, the rabbis excommunicated him. Although this news was not widely broadcast, some rabbis did follow him. He was expelled from Jerusalem, but his following kept growing and growing. News of the Messiah reached Yemen. Even Christians became enthused. By 1666, the prayer that is recited to this day in synagogues, uh, he who grants dominion to kings and princes, uh, may he keep and preserve whoever the ruler is, uh, was altered to read, King of Israel, the Sultan, Sabbatai Svi, had Shabbatai gone too far by setting himself up as a rival to the Sultan himself. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We are still in August 1665. Shabbatai has left Palestine. He is given a rapturous welcome in Aleppo. His popularity is at its zenith. He moves on to Smyrna. In one of his highs, he pronounces God's name, eats forbidden fats and does other things against the law, pushing others to do likewise. He walks through fire without harm to himself or his clothing. There are rumors that Sarah, his wife, has committed adultery. The community is divided. 25 rabbis in Constantinople tell rabbis in Smyrna that Shabbatai deserves to die. When Shabbatai hears that the rabbis are plotting against him, he proclaims a day of public prayer. He changes the order of the service, ascends the steps to the ark, knocks seven times with his staff and commands the inevitable name be pronounced, sorry, the ineffable name be pronounced. He parades with much pomp, flanked by two rabbis holding the hem of his robe, doling out flowers and sweets. Here he is proclaiming himself Messiah. On the 12th of December, 1665, there occurred an event even more dramatic, this time at the Portuguese synagogue in Smyrna. The Portuguese synagogue was a stronghold of the unbelievers. It was the most influential synagogue in the city. The most prominent member was the wealthy merchant Chaim Pena. Pena made offensive remarks about Shabbatai one Sabbath, Shabbatai went to the Portuguese synagogue. Here it is. The crowd of Sabbatean supporters tried to break in and stone Pena. Some say Pena escaped over the roof or through a window. Shabbatai found the doors locked. He asked for an axe and began to smash the doors down. He interrupted the prayers and preached a blasphemous sermon. 
Today you are exempt from prayer, he declared to the congregation. First, he called his brother Elijah to the law, although he was not a Kohen, and he made him king of Turkey. Next, he called his second brother, although he was not a Levite, and declared him king of Rome. He forced the congregation to say the ineffable name and gave them each kingdoms. The rabbis summoned him the next day, but he went to the Turkish caddy or judge and gave him a gift or bribe. He insulted the rabbis and compared them to unclean animals. He threatened to excommunicate them. On the Monday, he declared it was Shabbat. He took the scroll out, sang songs, including Christian songs, saying that a Kabbalistic mystery was hidden in impure songs. He called women to the Torah, offending against the role of the sexes. He held a banquet with mixed dancing. The public paid him homage in the Portuguese synagogue, giving him charity. Unbelievers also gave charity, fearing violence if they did not. All night he held a banquet and people kissed his feet. He distributed money and sweets and forced all to say the name of God, including Gentiles. Even Turks started talking about Shabbatai, king of Israel. He was ready to go to Constantinople and be crowned the new sultan. The skeptic Emmanuel Francis wrote this satirical poem. Is he the Lord's anointed one or a traitor, a wicked sinner and a fornicator? In public, he the Sabbath desecrates and of the synagogue, he breaks the gates. To pronounce the name ineffable, he dares and with profanity, he impiously swears. Forbidden women he embraces as for the one, then the other he caresses. The foolish people, gaping as spellbound, affirm this is a mystery profound. Once again, Shabbatai was summoned before the court of rabbis in Smyrna. He left the court in a violent rage. He went to a Turkish caddy or judge who thought him a fool or a madman. Legend has it that he sat in the Qadi's chair. A flame issued from his mouth and caught the Qadi's beard. The Qadi was bribed to let him go. The rumor spread that he had not touched his wife, Sarah. Consummation was now required for messianic fulfillment. Evidence of Sarah's virginity, despite her reputation as a harlot, was then presented to the crowd. Shabbatai announced that she had conceived a son. In fact, in October 1666, she did have a son, Ishmael Mordechai, but he died in adolescence. Shabbatai announced that the fast of Tibet, which falls in December, would be abolished. The rabbis who objected fled fearing they would be lynched. Reports of messianic unrest reached Constantinople and spread to Greece. There were torchlight processions with the crowd chanting, long live the messianic king. The Turkish Sultan was getting increasingly anxious. Messianic fever was disrupting normality and trade. Shabbatai was expelled from Smyrna and arrested. He spent two months in jail in Constantinople. He could have bribed his way out of jail, but refused to do so. He was up to his antics again, causing tortures to appear in the whole prison. He was allowed to immerse himself in the sea under guard. Then he was moved to a fortress in Gallipoli. It was now Passover, 1666. He sacrificed a paschal lamb and roasted it with unkosher fat. Blessed art thou who permittest that which is forbidden. By then, word of the Messiah had reached Italy and Amsterdam. Salonika became one of the most important centers. 
the movement had a great impact on the 60,000 Jews. Penitents buried themselves up to their necks. There were 700 marriages of young children because everyone had to be married in the Messianic age. Shops closed and the wealthy became impoverished. People fasted and mortified themselves. Some people died. In Gallipoli prison, the jailers made fortunes charging admission permits for visitors to visit Shabbatai. People streamed in by boat. Pilgrims came from Persia, Medea, Babylonia, Morocco, Yemen, even France and Spain. Most Jews in Constantinople supported Shabbatai. Wealthy Jews sent him royal apparel and fabrics fit for a king. Shabbatai was accused of having relations with women while in jail. Sarah was there too. Perhaps his ascetic tendencies were corrupted under her influence. The movement reached its peak when Shabbatai abolished the fast of the ninth of Av, traditionally the day of mourning for all the calamities that had befallen the Jewish people. He proclaimed it as a festival. Even Muslims began to believe in Shabbatai, but the authorities became alarmed when he started prophesying the fall of the Turkish Empire. Shabbatai expected a visit from Nathan. Instead, an unknown rabbi pitched up. Rabbi Nehemiah Cohen's appearance was the start of Shabbatai's downfall. Cohen was a Kabbalist from Lvov in Poland, a pedant with no imagination, says Sholem. He came to verify that Shabbatai was indeed the Messiah. He said that he himself was a better candidate as he was from the house of Joseph and a survivor of the Chialniki massacres. According to the prophecy, a Messiah would first arise from the house of Joseph after having avenged the blood of the dead. The matter of the house of Joseph, Messiah, became a burning issue in the Sabbatean movement. The Messiahs debated for three days. At the, the end, Nehemiah was called an enticer and renegade. He ran away, pretending to be a, pretended to be a Muslim. Then he went back to Poland and repented. The advisor to the Sultan, the Grand Vizier, asked Nehemiah for his own version of events. He reported the Sultan to the Sultan that Shabbatai was an imposter who was guilty of sedition. Shabbatai was taken from Gallipoli to the imperial capital, Adrianople. The Sultan ordered a meeting of his advisors. One was an apostate Jewish physician. Shabbatai was presented with the choice, either be beheaded or take the turban, that is, convert to Islam. Shabbatai Svi chose to convert to Islam and took the turban. He was appointed the Sultan's doorkeeper, treated as a VIP and given a royal pension. Sarah also converted. Shabbatai was instructed by the Sultan to take a second wife. Nathan became a fugitive and wandered through the Middle East until his death in 1680. Shabbatai was caught singing psalms with the Jews and banished. He ended up in Montenegro. There is a statue of him. Uh, so this is what happened when Shabbatai converted to Islam. His opponents declared him a deceiver and a false messiah. And former supporters did penance. You can see them being flayed uh, by branches and other things. And this is his house in Smyrna, which was recently uh, restored. You can see it's quite a grand house. And this is his statue in this village in Montenegro where he died. It's called Inchil. I think uh, he's sort of 
he strikes a very swaggering pose, doesn't he? He doesn't look like a rabbi at all. And he's holding a, a kind of mini Torah in one hand, or maybe it's a Megillah. Um, so other messianic movements have arisen in Jewish history, but none has encompassed the entire Jewish people, such as this one. The disappointment among his supporters when he took the turban was profound, but some clung tenaciously to their belief in him. 300 families, mostly in Salonika, chose to convert to Islam with Shabbatai. They became known as the Donme, which means converts in Turkish. Just as the crypto Jews in Spain practiced Judaism in secret but were outwardly Catholic, the Donme were meant outwardly to be Muslim and observe Jewish practices in private. Over time, their culture became a kind of mishmash of Judaism, Islam, and Sufism. They maintained secret traditions and observed some Jewish festivals, but also Ramadan. They split into three sects, uh, some with quite different beliefs, and they married amongst themselves until uh, quite recently. Uh, some espoused liberal causes and were active in the revolutionary party known as the Young Turks. Uh, as people in the Muslim world do when they want to discredit a politician by calling him a Jew, their opponents uh, held the Jewish origins of the Donma against them and spread conspiracy theories. With independence, Greece expelled the Muslims from its territory, including the Salonika Donma, and most migrated to Turkey, where by the middle of the century, they ceased to observe their traditions and became highly assimilated. There are probably 2000 Donma left today. We, we once knew the descendant of a Donma, she was the granddaughter of a well-known newspaper editor uh, who freely admitted to his Jewish roots, uh, but she didn't have much affinity with Jews. And I think her family really just thought of themselves as, as Turkish. There is an epilogue to this story. And uh, th this is the Donma uh, Mosque in Salonika, which was built during the Ottoman Empire. There is, the, the epilogue is, is really what was, was Mustafa Kemal, the founder of modern Turkey, was he a donna? We know that the family came from Salonika. Uh, he was taken out of an Islamic school and put into a European style school. And there's a story about Mustafa Kemal when he was serving in the Ottoman army in Jerusalem. The son of Ben Yehuda, who you will remember was the, the sort of pioneer of the revival of the Hebrew language, uh, the son of Ben Yehuda, um, a man called Ben Avi, met Mustafa Kemal in the Kamenitz Hotel in Jerusalem one autumn night in 1911, when uh, Mustafa Kemal was serving in the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman army as a captain. Do you see that Turkish officer sitting there in the corner, the one with a bottle of Arak, the proprietor of the hotel asked uh, Ben Avi. He's one of the most important officers in the Turkish army. What's his name? Mustafa Kemal. I'd like to meet him, said Ben Avi. Ben Avi describes two meetings with Mustafa Kemal, who had not yet taken the name Ataturk, father of the Turks. Both meetings were conducted in French, were largely devoted to Ottoman politics, and were doused with large amounts of Arak. In the first of these, Kemal confided, I'm a descendant of Shabbatai Zvi, 
not indeed a Jew anymore, but an ardent, ardent admirer of this prophet of yours. My opinion is that every Jew in this country would do well to join his camp. During his second, their second meeting, held 10 days later in the same hotel, Mustafa Kemal said at one point, I have at home a Hebrew Bible printed in Venice. It's rather old and I remember my father bringing me uh, to a Karaite teacher who, brought, who taught me to read it. I can still remember a few words of it, such as, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Loheinu, Adonai Echad. That's our most important prayer, Captain, said Ben Avi. So was this story true? Was Mustafa Kemal really a don man? Well, Turks would deny that the father of the Turkish nation had Jewish roots. We, we may never know. So I'll leave you to ponder that thought. Very happy to answer questions if I can. Thank you for listening. Just start at the top there. Laurie, Laurie asked, where or why did the concept of, of Messiah arise? Well, I'm not an expert on religion, but I do believe the concept of a Messiah is, is very much part of Judaism. Uh, you know, it is said that uh, a Messiah will arise, a, a descendant of King David, and uh, that will usher in a, a period of peace and harmony and the brotherhood of man. And of course, Ezekiel talks about, um, you know, turning plow, um, swords into plowshares and, and that kind of thing. Uh, Linda asks, was, was Rabbi Joseph Iskafa one of the most, most vehement opponents to Shabbat Haizvi? Yes, he was. Mural Lichter, I'm sure you're a, you're a psychologist. <laughs> he sounds like he was a homosexual who suffered from bipolar illness. He definitely did suffer from bi bipolar illness. We don't know if he was... Uh, a homosexual, but he certainly seemed to have sexual issues, don't you think? And thank you, Marlene, for correcting my, my pronunciation of Chilnitsky. Yeah, I think I did pronounce it once correctly. Uh, <laughs> Frida, I very much advise you to read the book by Olga Tomaschuk, The Book of Jacobs. From this book, the writer got a Nobel. Thank you very much, Frida, for that recommendation. Tokar Shuk. Uh, Anne, oh, nice to see you, Anne. Uh, thank you very much for your compliment. Um, I just tried to scroll down, just one second. Sorry, Shauna, can you read out the next question? I think- Absolutely, my... absolutely. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, let's see. Sorry, a bit uh, Brian Conway would like to know where are the, the remnants of the Don may now? Yeah, so they are in Turkey. Uh, they are no longer in Salonika because they were kicked out of, of Salonika. Uh, and um, I think they are mainly in Turkish cities like Istanbul. I think they're very much part of the sort of liberal Western elite. Uh, Esther Nussbaum is asking if you could define what Donme means. So Donme means convert in Turkish, but it also has connotations of being a, a turncoat, a, perhaps a traitor, <laughs> uh, with, with everything that implies. Yes, I think I can now scroll down. Thank you. Uh, are there known descendants of Ataturk who could get <laughs> you know, uh, genomic testing? Well, that's a good question, uh, Zoom user. I don't think we can help there. Where do the Frankists fit in? You'll have to ask Trudy that, Dawn. Uh, Christopher Boulle, merci madame, de rien monsieur. Fascinating talk. It would be interesting to hear a present-day scholar discuss current 
current understanding of the messianic pro prophecy. Yes, I know my limitations when it comes to uh, talking about religion. Um, Harvard alumni, sorry, I just uh, scrolled down there. Can you tell us about the connection of Shabbatai and Hasidism? Yes, Shabbatai did influence uh, movements such as Hasidim, Hasidism. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, it is said that the, the Hasids declared, um, well, certainly Chabad declared um, Rabbi Schneerson as their Messiah. Um, again, you'll have to you'll have to ask a, a sort of a, an expert, really, to give you more uh, more information about that. Um, sorry, slightly. Thank you for your compliments, Abigail and Erica. Sorry, it keeps getting stuck. <laughs> Can you just uh, read out the next question, Shauna? Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, Naomi uh, Shari would like to know, how do we know the exact dates mentioned in your talk that you referred to? Um, well, we do know the exact dates because it was quite well documented at this, at this particular moment, 1665 and 1666. Um, we don't know other things like, for instance, exactly when Shabbatai was born uh, and that sort of thing. But I, I think, uh, you know, his antics were, were quite well documented, whether by his opponents or by his uh, followers. Um, I mean, the Gershom Sholem draws on a, on a host of different sources to put together a picture of, of what happened in those, you know, fateful years. Uh, Faye Katzman would like to know, do you know approximately how many names of false messiahs have been reported? I don't know that. You could, uh, you could look it up on Wikipedia <laughs> or ask an expert. I'm sure um, the rabbis would be able to answer that. Uh, Lorna, historians, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Lorna, thanks you for your excellent presentation, Lynn. Uh, she'd like to know, how was he able to travel from country to country who funded him? Well, he money didn't seem to be a problem for him. Uh, you know, you could see from his house that, you know, he had, uh, he had a, a very grand looking house. He came from a wealthy family. He was given money by people like Raphael Joseph, who was a Kabbalist uh, in, uh, in Egypt. So uh, money was not an issue. And it's amazing how people did travel, um, you know, far and wide in those times. They, they went the le length and breadth of the Ottoman Empire. And they came from Poland to, uh, you know, to Jerusalem and uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, you know, it, it is amazing how how people did get around. Um, uh, Richard Coker would like to know over how many years did the movement that he sparked last. So um, the the peak of it was during uh, during that year between 65 and, and 66, 1666. Um, but if you're talking about the Donma, um, well, obviously they, they survived until the present day and their descendants still live in Turkey and they still practice sort of bits of his, his whole, um, you know, his, his whole philosophy. Um, and as somebody pointed out, obviously, Sabbateanism did influence uh, Hasidism. Uh, so you can say that it kind of lasted. Uh, there was a kind of legacy there. Um, yeah. Uh, Bundli would like to know, uh, the, Ac the Amsterdam Sephardic community is reputed to have provided a lot of financial backing between mm -hmm. 1665 to 66. Are there any records regarding that? I wouldn't know about that in particular, but certainly, um, you know, people contributed from all over the Jewish world. 
uh, to fund uh, his movement. So I'm not surprised if Amsterdam um, did, did um, you know, contribute as well. You know, you've got to realize that this, this actually took the, the whole Jewish world by storm, you know, and perhaps the majority of Jews believed in him at one point. Um, uh, so we have a question from Don. Uh, she'd like to know, how did the Jewish community respond to his conversion? Well, they're hugely disappointed, but obviously they began to think that they'd been deceived by him. And that's why only a minority really decided to follow him. I have 300 families in uh, Salonika. Uh, the, rest, uh, the rest realized that they'd made a terrible mistake. I think, I think that's really the answer. Um, those are all the questions for today, Lynn. That's it, okay. Well, thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely afternoon and we'll see you back um, at two o'clock. Take care.